Mel, you could hear me okay? Mel? You could hear me okay? Amen. Amen. I, Joe, I see your thumbs. Thank you. Todd, we're good to go. Amen. Church, we've heard before Pastor Clark say that no matter what, right? No matter what, we must keep the main thing the main thing, right? It's not so easy to do, though, is it? It's not so easy to do when we have our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own wants, our own everything. You know, church, today's a beautiful day. It's always a beautiful day with the Lord, isn't it? It's a beautiful day, and this is another day that God has given us on this earth. So we praise God for that. But let's not, remember, let's not forget that God gave us another day on this earth for a reason. And it's not just so that He could find amusement or enjoyment by watching us like a bunch of little fish swimming around in a bowl. He has a purpose for our lives, right? Amen. So church, I thank you for being here today because I know you know that and I know that's why you're here. You're not here for me. You're not here for each other. You're, you're here for the Lord and I praise God for that. To those of you who join us online, I want to say welcome. And even though that you can't be here with us, I praise God that He could be there with you. Amen? Now for the last couple of weeks, we clearly heard and now know what this whole Sabbath-keeping thinking is all about. And we have clearly heard that Jesus is Lord and He's Lord over the Sabbath. Amen? Now, when looking at Christ's life in a chronological order, today, like all of them have been, is another exciting day. Today is what one could call a pivotal turning point in Jesus' ministry here on earth. Now, to recall our memory, because if your memory is like mine, it's no good at all, right? But to recall our memory and to understand how this is a a pivotal turning point, we must remember the things that happened so far in Christ's life. The things that we've already seen so far. I mean, we've seen the birth of Jesus. You remember that? Remember we've seen how this world had nothing to offer Jesus from His birth. And then that His birth itself caused King Herod and all of Jerusalem to be deeply disturbed just by hearing the news that Jesus was born. We saw the shepherds coming to Jesus, which was the good news that the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born. We saw the circumcision and naming of Jesus, and Jesus being presented at the temple at 40 days old, which left His parents in amazement and even disbelief after hearing the prophets speak about this little baby. This showed us that one can personally One can personally be visited by an angel. One could personally become pregnant by the Holy Spirit while still being a virgin. And God still has the ability to amaze us. Amen? We then seen the Magi or the wise men visiting Jesus. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus escaping to Egypt. Herod trying to kill Jesus as a baby and Jesus' family returning to Nazareth. Which showed us that despite how awful, evil, sinful, and murderous this world is, God will always protect His flock. Amen. Then the next testimony recorded for us to learn from is where we found Jesus at the temple at the age, age of 12. If you remember, this was an exciting moment because it is in this testimony where we find the very first words that Jesus Himself personally spoke and that were recorded for us to learn from. And we found Jesus asking us, Why do you seek Me? Do you not know I must be about My Father's business? We then moved into the beginning of Jesus' ministry with Jesus' baptism. And we saw immediately how immediately after His baptism the Spirit led him out into the wilderness where Jesus was tempted by Satan. We saw John the Baptist's disciples that followed after Jesus 
Which left us with the second question that Jesus asked us. And that is, what do you want? We then saw Jesus inviting Philip and Nathaniel to follow him. Which we learned to follow Jesus means to come after him. To track him, to trace him, to keep track of him. To grab onto him and grasp him and seize him. To perceive him. To be aware of him and understand him and comprehend him. To know him and gather with him and trail behind him. We then seen Jesus at a wedding and seen how easily our own mere human concerns can try to get Jesus involved in things that are not of his hour. After that, we saw Jesus clearing the temple courts for the first time which clearly showed us that the things of this world have no business in God's temple. Remember, Jesus said, get these out of here and stop turning my father's house into a market. Remember, we learned that our bodies are the temple. Amen. We then moved into Jesus' visit with Nicodemus, where we heard Jesus tell us very clearly Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. After this, we found Jesus' visit with a Samaritan at the well. And we found that Jesus was there to restore the marriage covenant that God had with the Samaritans and that they used to live in. We then saw Jesus healing a royal official's son, which we learned that taking Jesus for his word like the royal official did, is all we need to do. Because after all, we know if Jesus said it, that settles it. Amen? After this, we seen Jesus rejected in the synagogue, which was one of the saddest testimonies we've heard so far. If you recall, they tried to kill Jesus. They wanted to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And if you remember, the saddest part of this testimony was that any one of those Jews could have gone with Jesus and walked with Jesus if they would have just set aside their own mere human concerns. From here, we then saw Jesus call his first four disciples. And we've seen how not only did Simon Peter and his brother Andrew leave the biggest catch of their lives behind to follow Jesus, We also saw that James and John left their father Zebedee on the boat to follow Jesus. After this, we then saw Jesus heal a man with an evil spirit in the synagogue. Now, not only was that an ode ode to religion that has become polluted with sin, it also shows us that just because someone wears a cross around their neck and spits some scripture out of their mouths, and even enters a church from time to time, does not mean that they're here for the purposes of God. As the evil spirit said, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Why are you interfering with us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Remember, church, remember, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So don't be surprised then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. From here, we then saw Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law and Jesus healing a man with leprosy, which showed us that Jesus truly does have authority over both the things of this world and the things in the spiritual realms, demonstrating to us that he has the power over life, death, this physical world and the spiritual one. And we found that even an incurable death sentence like leprosy had no effect on Jesus at all when he reached out and touched the man. After this, we saw Jesus forgiving the sins of a paralytic man that was lowered through the roof. And I know, I know often our minds want to say, no, he healed the man. But remember, seeing their faith Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. 
which showed us something that most of us have never even realized before. It showed us that Jesus did not have to die on the cross to be the Savior of our souls. Jesus already had the ability to forgive sins. But because, amen, but because out of obedience, out of obedience to the Father, Jesus chose to lay His life down for us. And by doing so, He demonstrated God's love for us in this one and simple truth. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. From here we saw Jesus calling Matthew the tax collector, who even the Pharisees considered a sinful person for choosing such a profession. And we've seen how one simple invitation to follow Jesus changed Matthew's life forever. After that, we moved into the second year of Jesus' ministry, and we've seen Jesus healing the paralytic at the pool, which brought upon us the third question that Jesus asks us. And that question Jesus asks us is, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Which clearly showed us something. It showed us that we, mankind, we have an awful time listening to God. We might hear what He says, but do we listen to what He says? Nicodemus, arguing with Jesus, said, How can someone be born again when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb. The woman at the well, arguing with Jesus, said, You have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? And the paralytic at the pool argues with Jesus, saying, I have no one to help me into the pool. When I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. We then saw Jesus' disciples picking grain on the Sabbath, Jesus healing a right hand on the Sabbath, and Jesus healing others on the Sabbath, which showed us the atrocity of religion in the hardened hearts of the religious leaders towards Jesus. And we saw Jesus explain to them and to us the true meaning of this whole Sabbath thing. And Jesus let us know clearly that He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now church, it is clearly evident that since His birth, the world had nothing to offer Jesus. Nor does it us. Twice, twice already Jesus showed us this truth. Once He said, I do not accept human testimony. And then when the evil spirit said, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. We know you're the Holy One of Israel. Jesus said, be quiet. Why? I mean, think about that. If we were in his shoes, many of us would have told the crowd, look, 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 even the demon knows. Even the demon knows. But Jesus said, be quiet. Jesus is clearly showing us that the ways of this world, the things of this world, the ideas of this world, and everything in this world have nothing that we need at all. And that is why today we are going to hear Jesus tell us and tell His disciples and tell the apostles something very important. Like I said earlier, today is a pivotal point in Jesus' ministry. Today is the day that Jesus names His twelve apostles. And the day that Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, which you can see is found in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, Mark chapter 3 verses 13 through 19, and Luke chapter 6, 12 through 16. And the reason I have that up there, you all know, is because I want you to go home and find this out yourself, right? So to start... In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19, we find, Afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones He wanted to go with Him. And they came to Him. Then He appointed twelve of them and called them 
his apostles. They were to accompany him and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. There are the twelve that he chose. Now let's stop for a moment and let's look at what Luke has to say. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, we find one day, soon afterward, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. And he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be the apostles. Here are their names. Simon, who he named Peter. Andrew, Peter's brother. James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, son of Alphaeus. Simon, who was the, called the Zealot. Judas, son of James. And Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. When they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a, a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowd. There were people from all over, Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the seacoasts of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch him because healing power went out from him and he healed everyone. Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began, he began to teach them. Now church, we're going to switch to the book of Matthew for the rest of this sermon because Matthew is the more detailed one this time. And starting in Matthew chapter 5, we find the Beatitudes. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who are hunger, those who hunger for thirst, for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember... The ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled under the, underfoot as worthless. You, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine. Let them shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I have came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, 
Not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, Jesus says, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifices to God. When you are on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. You have heard the commandments that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife unless she has been unfaithful causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. You have also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows. You must carry out those vows you made to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. You have heard the law that says the punishment, punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give them your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it for two miles. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard that the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In that way, 
In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For He gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. And He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is in there in that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect. Do you hear that? You are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Watch out, though. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing their trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating the words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need and forgive us of our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so that people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth that that is the only reward that they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no, no one will notice your fasting except your Father who knows what you do in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your whole body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot, be, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money, riches, or mammoth or whatever they call it. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. 
Isn't life more than food? And your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wild flowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What shall we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. You got that? Do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of, the say, of saying to your friend, let me help remove that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you'll find it. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So, in your, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? Do to others whatever you would like to them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only few ever find it. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by the, their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick Grapes from a thorn bush or frigs from a thistle? A good tree produces good fruit. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit... So you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and we perform many miracles in your name. But Jesus will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rains come in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on the rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Now church, I know, that's a lot at once, ain't it? That's three chapters. It's a lot at once. But I also know that's exactly, I know that God gave us this because that's exactly what we need to hear today. The way you just heard the Sermon on the Mount is the same way Jesus told it to His apostles and disciples. And just like us, just like us, I'm sure that they did not fully understand the meaning of what Jesus is telling them, right? I mean, after all, what in the world does it mean when Jesus said, God blesses those who mourn for they'll be comforted, right? What does that mean? What does it mean God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the earth? Listen, I remember the first time going through these passages. The first time I went through these passages of Scripture... Somebody left their walkie-talkie up here. Anyways, I remember going through these scriptures for the first time. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't know what any of this means. And I know that I'm not any of those things. So let's just skip this and flip to the next page. Let me just tell you, that's the wrong answer, folks. Even though I did that many times, I don't understand what God's saying. This makes no sense to me, and I know I'm not one of those people. So the easiest thing to do is say, God, not for me, and let's flip it and keep going. But that's the wrong answer. God tells us. He tells us, and we know this. If any of us, if any of us lack wisdom, right? If any of us lack wisdom, we should ask God for it, right? We should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, And He will give us wisdom. Church, I will say it again. Do not base your faith simply off what God is giving us here at Midweek Connections. You hear that? Don't base your faith off of what's being preached from this pulpit on Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, or any other day of the week. Base your faith off of what God tells you personally. Amen? Yes, these disciples... And these 12 apostles heard this message in its entirety all at once. And I'm, like I said, I'm sure they did not understand it in its entirety. However, they continued spending time with Jesus, being taught the true meaning of this message. And that is what I urge you to do, church. I urge you to go home and open up Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And ask God to speak and teach to you, teach you directly. Because the truth is, we all have a place. We all have a place somewhere in what we just heard today, don't we? Maybe you have a problem with your attitude. And you need to learn the Beatitudes. Maybe you're having a hard time being the salt and the light. Maybe you have a hard time believing what you heard last week about the Sabbath and the law. Maybe you have anger issues. Maybe you're an adulteress. Maybe not physically, but maybe more spiritually, right? Because we have a marriage covenant with God, right? 
Maybe you're someone who's having a hard time keeping your word, keeping your vows, letting your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. Maybe you're somebody who wants revenge all the time and cannot love their enemies. Maybe you can't even pray for them. Maybe you're someone who does not take care of the poor and needy. And that's not just physically, but also spiritually. Maybe you're someone who doesn't understand what this whole prayer and fasting thing is all about. Maybe you're someone who focuses on money and possessions and the here and now instead of storing up treasures in heaven. Maybe you're someone who has a problem judging others and does not live by the golden rule. Maybe you're someone who's been eating from the wrong tree for so long that you don't even realize it or even care anymore. This is probably the most dangerous place to be because after all, we just heard Jesus say, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what that means? Or are you just going to let Jesus say that, say that and let it fly by your head because you don't understand it? Think about what he said. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. These people are going to cry out, Lord, we've done miracles in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we've done all these things in your name. And Jesus say, well, depart from me. Depart from me. I don't think anybody wants to let that one go unfigured out. But maybe, maybe, maybe you're someone who truly wants their building built on a solid foundation. Amen. And maybe you know that that's Jesus. And maybe you know that Jesus said, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise. They're like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. I hope that's the maybe that you all are. Because that's the best poem, isn't it? So church, as we close, let me just say, I don't know where any of you are at. I don't know where you're at. You might not even know where you're at in the list of all these people that we just heard. But God knows just who you are. And He has given us the power of His Holy Spirit to lead us to all truth and give us the ability to make that change. And that's one of the greatest things about the Sermon on the Mount. It addresses the apostles, the disciples, the crowd that came to hear Jesus speak, and the crowd that just came to be healed. So church, once again, let me just tell you, do not let this service be your all in all. Only Jesus can be that. If anything, if anything, consider this sermon to be a menu into what Jesus has already prepared for you. So church, go home. Go home and spend all night in prayer if you have to. And let God show you where you need to make changes in your life so that you may live a life worthy of the calling you received. Amen? Amen. That's it. That's all I got. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank You, Lord. I thank You, Father, that Your Word is enough that You're enough, that everything, everything that You are is all that we need. Father, Lord, thank You for giving us this life. Thank You for creating this world and all the beauty in it so that we can actually enjoy it, that we can recognize the works that You've done and we could sit back and just be in awe of Your presence. Father, we know that You created this world and it was good and that we brought sin into this world and we polluted what You made for us. And despite that, Lord, You love us. You love us enough not only just to save us and rescue us, but to guide us and teach us so that we could be better for each other and we could be better for You. So, Father, I just pray. I pray, Lord, that You just put it on our hearts. Burn our hearts. Burn our minds, Lord. Inflict us with pain if You have to so we could hear and find the need and the reason to grow closer to You. So, Lord, I just pray and ask that as we go from Your home, that You continue to give us the opportunities to be used by You and to grow with You. It's in Jesus' name we pray and thank You, Lord. Amen. Amen. Ed?
Todd, you could go ahead and stop that video, brother. It's a red button. It says end live.